The Bible Explained by Pastor Michael Yeo. Shalom and welcome to our online Bible study once again. We trust that the Lord is blessing you with His life-giving word. Now today we are considering the question, Who is the greatest? Now of course we are asking this question in the context of God's kingdom. The passage for our lesson today is Luke 22, 24-30. Now verse 24 goes this way. Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. The most important event in human history was about to take place and the disciples were still arguing about their prestige in the kingdom. The disciples had already had this discussion in chapter 9 and Jesus had told them that they should be like children. The least among them would be the greatest. Now verse 25 to 26, And Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger and he who governs as he who serves. Now the world system of leadership varies greatly from leadership in God's kingdom. But among Christians, the master is to be like a servant. Whatever the style of leadership Every Christian leader needs a servant's heart. Now verse 27, For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. Jesus did not come to sit at the table and be served. He came as a servant. Greatness is determined by servanthood. The truly great leader places his or her needs last, as Jesus exemplified. Because Jesus served, his disciples must also seek to serve, not seeking to occupy better positions. Being a servant did not mean occupying a servile position, rather it meant having an attitude of life that freely attended to others' needs without expecting or demanding anything in return. Verse 28 to 30, But you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom just as my Father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now the disciples had remained true to Jesus throughout the three years of ministry and the hardship it often entailed. They had been willing to be servants, sharing the gospel message and healing people through Jesus' power. The words, I now grant you, the right to eat and drink at my table in that kingdom refer to Jesus' promise that because of their faith in Him, they would enjoy the promised messianic banquet with Him. In addition, they would also sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. God may allow persecution to continue for a while, but the destiny of His followers is to possess the kingdom and live with Him forever. Some Reflections The greatest in God's sight are those who humbly serve. This is a lesson that all who are serving Christ must continually apply. Being a servant of Christ is more than just signing up to teach Sunday school or to do some other job at the church. Being a servant is a mindset where each day you make yourself available to Christ and ask Him to use you in His service in whatever ways He chooses. It may be to speak a word about the Saviour to someone who needs Him. It may be to offer cheerful help to someone in need. It may be to listen to a person who needs sympathy or understanding. But whatever the job your daily attitude is, Lord, here I am, use me as your servant. 
If we are not living in that way, then we are living for self, not for Christ. Our text brings out four important lessons in servanthood. The great example of servanthood, Jesus Christ. Now, although Luke presumably did not know about and thus did not record the event, John 13 reports that at some time during the supper, Jesus got up, girded himself with a towel, took a basin of water and washed the disciples' feet. Note four things here. One is that Jesus faithfully served although he alone deserves eternal supremacy. Peter, James and John got a brief glimpse of Jesus' glory on the Mount of Transfiguration and they were all struck. Later on the Isle of Patmos, John, who had laid his head on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper, got a further revelation of Christ in his heavenly glory. This lot of glory left the splendour of heaven and took on the form of a servant and humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, if Jesus who deserves supremacy as the Almighty Creator, willingly serve, then should not we, who deserve nothing except judgment, offer ourselves in faithful service to God. The other thing is that Jesus faithfully served through many trials and temptations. Jesus tells the disciples, and you are those who have stood by me in my trials. Now, after Jesus had successfully resisted the devil in the wilderness, we read that the devil departed from him until an opportune time. Now, although Jesus did not have a sin nature tempting him from within, as we do, he was perpetually bombarded from without by the great enemy of our souls. Satan continually dangled before Jesus ways to escape the cross. He tempted him to exert his power and assert his authority apart from God's plan. But in spite of all these temptations, Jesus faithfully humbled himself and served the Father's purpose, even to the point of death. Jesus faithfully served, though lonely and misunderstood. Now, although the disciples had stood with Jesus up to this point, even through some intense opposition, Jesus knew that in a short while, they would all forsake him and flee for their lives. As he told them in the upper room, Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered each to his own home and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me in John 16. The other thing is that Jesus faithfully served because of his great love for us. Christ's amazing love is the only explanation for why he would leave the glory of heaven and submit himself to all of the abuse and hardship he went through to secure our salvation. John 13 states that Jesus loved his own who were in the world and that he loved them to the uttermost. Now, just as Christ served because of his great love for us, and Paul served because he was captivated by Christ's love, so we should serve because of Christ's love for us and our love for Him. The second thing that we want to take note is that the great enemy of servanthood is self. The disciples' squabble came from one source, self. Self reveals itself in pride. You would think that right after the Lord's Supper, this sort of dispute among these men would not have happened, but it did. Pride and selfishness which are actually related, are the most common and troubling problems we face. In the next section, Peter's pride comes through as he protests that he is ready to die with Jesus. Peter believed in his own commitment more than he believed Jesus' word. Now, these men who had walked in close relationship with Christ, 
could fall into the pride of proclaiming their own greatness right after the Lord's Supper, then we are not immune. Self also reveals itself in competition. The apostles were doing what men by nature are prone to do, competing for first place. In the church, we need to work at cooperation and to be careful not to compete. Is another church doing better than ours? If they preach the gospel, praise God. It means that our team is doing well. The other thing is that self is modelled for us in worldly leadership. Jesus describes worldly leadership where the top man lords it over others but then demands the title of benefactor. But then he states, but not so with you. Worldly leadership is not a model for biblical leadership. Biblical leadership does not lord it over people, even though at times it must exercise authority. Now this you can find in 1 Peter 5.3 and Titus 2.15. Biblical leadership does not demand recognition and status. It does not pay attention to titles. It does not use its position for personal advantage at others' expense. In all these areas, worldly leadership models selfish men seeking selfish advantage. Biblical leadership models servanthood even at personal sacrifice or inconvenience. The third thing is that the great encouragement to servanthood is Christ's grace in spite of our sins. Even though Jesus must have grief over this repeated petty quarrelling among his disciples, and even though he knew that they all would soon forsake him and flee, he gives them this gracious word of commendation that they have stood with him in his trials. And he goes on to encourage them by promising great rewards for them in his coming kingdom. Truly, as John 1.16 puts it, we have all received grace upon grace. If you have failed the Lord in your attempts to serve him, he wants you to hear his word of grace. He's like a father who is trying to teach his young child to do some new task. The child may fail or not do it perfectly, but the dad sees one little thing the child does right and say, that's the way. Keep it up. You are getting the idea. The fourth thing is that the great enjoyment of servanthood is to have fellowship and service with Christ throughout eternity. Christ here promises the disciples, the Greek word implies a covenant, that they will eat and drink at his table in his kingdom and that they will sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. In light of their recent dispute and in light of their impending failures, that is sheer grace. The fact is, the Lord will reward every one of His servants far beyond what we deserve. Eating and drinking at Jesus' table is a picture of the joyous fellowship that awaits all of us in His presence. If we could see now what He has prepared for us, then we all would be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our toil is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15 Any inconvenience or hardship we endure now in serving Christ will reap blessing upon blessing in that great day when His kingdom comes. Some discussion questions. One is this, what is the biggest obstacle you face as you seek to be a faithful servant of Christ? How do you overcome it? Secondly, is the Bible against all competition? Is it wrong to use competition as a motive in Christian service? Thirdly, to what degree should heavenly rewards motivate our service for the Lord? Is it selfish to labour for future rewards? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we bow ourselves before you in reverence and love 
Thank you for revealing to us that the greatest in God's sight are those who humbly serve. You are our great example of servanthood, faithfully serving although you alone deserve eternal supremacy. Because of love, you serve with determination through many trials and temptations, even though lonely and misunderstood. Thank you for warning us about self-centered motivations that reveal itself in pride and a competitive spirit. Thank you for your grace that sustains us as we serve you. And thank you for the reward of fellowship with you throughout eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining this session of The Bible Explained. If you've been blessed by this study, please like and share our church Facebook page and YouTube channel so more can be blessed by God's Word. If you'd like to get connected with us, there's the comment section or you can visit www.churchofpraise.org.my We'll see you in the next session as we continue our reading of the book of Luke. Do read the relevant passages beforehand in order to get the best out of the study. Lastly, if you have any questions, reach out to us via equipped at churchofpraise.org.my and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Looking forward to seeing you again.